Braxism Consensus 2018. Hi, Hi I'm Daniele, Daniele Manfredini. Traveling, Traveling around, around the world, the world it, happened it happened that, that I noticed some, some misunderstanding, misunderstanding concerning the recent consensus paper on Braxism. I had the opportunity to coordinate together with other friends around the world. And that's, and that's why, why I'm here to try reading, reading the consensus with you. Let's go. Let's go. First of all, some basic premises. When we talk about a consensus, it is implicit that every participant must have a compromise solution between his or her own beliefs and ideas to reach the final product in agreement with all the others. Fourteen specialists of different extractions, dentists, sleep doctors, psychologists or official pain experts took part to this consensus effort. Some of them were attending the general session closed meeting of the EADR in San Francisco 2017. Some others took part to the manuscript preparation via email or personal discussion. But it is important to notice since the beginning that we had specific goals in our mind. So it is, to be honest, unfair by the part of some researchers or readers to criticize specific words or specific sentencing or saying that something missing and so on. Because the summary of the paper speaks for itself. We got four aims. The first was to clarify the 2013 definitions in order to develop separate statements defining the sleep and awake practice conditions. The second aim was to discuss the issue of braxism as a muscle activity that may be a normal behavior or physiological behavior without any clinically relevant consequences. The third aim was to rediscuss and to uh, specify something more concerning the 2013 grading system which refer to possible, probable and definite bruxism diagnosis. And the fourth aim was to present some possible researches for the future agenda. So let's start from the beginning. Braxism definition. As stated in the summary, we provided two separate definitions, one for sleep and the other for awake braxism. Sleep braxism is defined as a masticatory muscle activity during sleep that is characterized as rhythmic, which means phasic contraction, or non-rhythmic, which means tonic-like contraction, and is not a movement disorder or a sleep disorder in otherwise healthy individuals. Awake braxis, on the other hand, is a masticatory muscle activity during wakefulness that is characterized by repetitive or sustained tooth contact and or by bracing or thrusting of the mandible and is not a movement disorder in otherwise healthy individuals. What's the behind the scenes of these definitions. First, both start with the concept of bruxism as a masticatory muscle activity. We are perfectly aware of the fact that in the text, as well as in previous discussions, bruxism was referred to as a behavior. What we meant is that bruxism should not necessarily consider a disorder or something that should be treated or even the single issue or the specific fact of contracting uh, uh, the jaw muscles by grinding the teeth. So, braxism is the electromyographic contraction of the muscle. So, that sign should be the requisite, the evaluation of that sign should be the requisite for future 
uh, assessment strategies. And the other aspect to point out is that, as I told you moments ago, braxism is not a pathology. Braxism is the sign of something. When we state in the manuscript or when we talk during the congresses or some international events or even Facebook posts that braxism is not a disorder, we don't intend that braxism is something that it is inevitably physiological or that doesn't require treatment. We just want to focus on the fact that in healthy individuals, some amount of muscle activity during the night is physiological and that we don't know which is the amount of activity that may lead to clinical consequences both for dental interest and medical interest. So, to summarize, based on the concepts that emerged from this consensus, braxism should be viewed as a muscular activity that can be seen as a behavior during wakefulness. And that is not necessarily a disorder, but might just be the sign of something. And this leads to the concept of primary versus secondary braxism. Braxism, as the electromyographic activity of the jaw muscles, should be viewed as a sort of fever, is a sign, is a symptom. So it is necessarily the mirror of something. So just using the words primary and secondary may be misleading because as soon as the knowledge on the possible risk factor or associated condition increase, we may be prone to diminish the quote of so-called primary braxism. So what's interesting to know is that every one of us has some electromyographic activity of the jaw muscles during the night. The amount and the additional activity in some persons may be the sign of something. And if we even want to speak about Braxism's treatment, it is important for us to understand that we should try to investigate for the possible causes. Second point is the discussion about the concept of Braxism as a behavior or risk factor and so on. And here it is quite intuitive to discuss that in many individuals having some amount of muscular activity of the jaw muscles during the night may be just a harmless behavior. In some other, that amount of activity may lead to clinical consequences. Think about pain in individual with prolonged tonic clenching type contraction or bracing of the mandible or individuals with tooth wear as a result of years of teeth grinding during the night. But in some cases, even we admit that at this stage of knowledge, it may be more a speculation than a real fact Braxis may be even be viewed as a protective factor. Think about the complex relationship with respiratory arousals, with cognitive decline or some other sleep conditions that may lead to negative health outcomes and they may be prevented with the activation of jaw muscles. The third point of the consensus manuscript was the redefinition or better the rediscussion of the Braxism assessment strategies. We approached the San Francisco conference 
having clear in mind that a stackable system with a yes or no approach to bruxism diagnosis was not the ideal approach. There are several problems with that approach. The first is implicit with the use of the term diagnosis itself, because if we are talking about something that is potentially physiologic, we suggested that the adoption for, of the term assessment or evaluation may be recommended in the future. The other concern was that after the 2013 paper, we received a lot of requests for specifications and still nowadays I honestly admit that I'm not sure we have succeeded in presenting really which were our intention. The diagnostic grading was just a suggestion. It is not a classification system, so it is a nonsense to ask experts if a patient who is self-reporting bruxism but also has some signs of tooth wear but no other clinical signs should be considered a possible or a probable bruxer. This was not our intention. And that's why we stated clearly in this 2018 paper that the best approach to assess praxis provides the combined use of non-instrumental approaches and instrumental approaches. Also, we clearly specify that using standard cutoff points in terms of number of sleep praxis events per hour of sleep to establish the presence or absence of praxis is not reflective of the clinical situation. Those criteria were just screening suggestions to identify people with more or less uh, bruxism activity and potentially related uh, clinical signs and symptoms. And it dated back to 25 years ago, but they were never intended to identify the relationship or to assess the relationship between bruxism and clinical consequences of dental interest. And we noticed that these kind of criteria and these kind of approaches are still really diffused, even in those meta-analyses of the literature that are becoming an increasing concern for this such an evolving field as bruxism and also temporomandibular disorders are. So the muscle activity that are related with bruxism should be assessed in their continuum. The real problem is that we don't have electromyographic or even polysonographic uh, algorithms now that may be able to quantify the amount of muscle work that is uh, over the baseline threshold. And during wakefulness, an alternative could be the ecological evaluation of the bruxism experience. And finally, the research agenda. Our goal for the future is to prepare a multidimensional evaluation tool. It is not yet defined in the consensus paper, but uh, it will be prepared over the next few years. And it has already been partly presented and discussed in some other papers. The multidimensional approach to the assessment of Braxis should include the evaluation of etiological factors, the evaluation of the Braxism status itself by gathering information based on the subject, based on the observation of clinical signs and symptoms, and based on the recordings of instrumental strategies. Electromyographic activity to measure the 
quantity of work of the masticatory muscles and polysonographic recordings to study the sleep correlates of those muscle activity. And the final goal of that multidimensional system, of course, will be to evaluate the relationship of all the previous factors with the clinical consequences. My dream is to use artificial intelligence procedure to predict the baseline status while observing the possible consequences and vice versa. So, coming back to the summary, I hope it is now clear that criticizing the consensus paper because there's something missing or criticizing the consensus paper because there's some specific concept that doesn't fit with a particular reader's idea of Braxis is unfair to the efforts we made so far because we were 14, we started from very different positions and even myself sometimes feel that there were some words with which I don't fully agree, but I guess it's normal. Otherwise, it should be a solo effort. Based on that, the conclusions were that we succeeded in our goals because we provided separate definitions and stated quite clearly that sleep and awake praxis are two uh, different conditions with specific subconditions that are included under the umbrella term praxis and they refer to specific masticatory muscle activities that being different and being present in different individuals may or may not have different clinical relevance. The second goal was to discuss Braxis as a behavior or risk factor and we came up quite clearly with the conclusion that Braxis should not consider a disorder but rather as a muscle behavior or activity that in some cases may have clinical consequences or be associated or be a risk factor for some clinical consequences and in some other situations it cannot be anything like that. The future, as we stated in the third conclusion on the assessment, will be to rely on combined approaches. As you can see, in the third conclusion about the assessment, we didn't present any diagnostic grading suggestions, but we simply refer to the list or to the fact that we discussed a list of instrumental and non-instrumental approaches that can be employed to assess praxis and, they, and that may have some advantages and some other disadvantages. For sure, and that's the conclusion number four, keep on using standard cutoff points to say Mr. X is a Braxer and Mr. Y is not should make no sense. Because Braxism related masticatory muscle activities should be measured as a continuum of activity or behavior. That's it. That's it. I hope you, I hope have, you enjoyed have enjoyed this 
this word by word, word by reading, word together. reading together and I hope that, and I hope that from, now on, from now on the possible, the possible misunderstandings, misunderstandings and doubts concerning the consensus the paper on Braxism, on Braxism are solved. Are solved. Works, works are in progress. Are in progress. We, need for you. we need for you. And we wait for you at the events of the Gruppo di Studio Italiano Disordini Cranio Mandibolari.